We apologize for this brief interruption in the show. As many of you likely know, the Higher Standard Podcast is officially sponsored by Transcend Company. Transcend has been my longtime provider for both testosterone and peptide therapies, but they offer so much more. Whether you're interested in health, wellness, or longevity, it all begins with you getting your blood work done. A lab draw will help you get the numbers and establish your baseline. You can go to transcendcompany.com slash THSP. That's transcendcompany.com slash THSP. Or you can click the link in the show notes on any streaming platform and on YouTube. Fill out your information and one of the representatives will contact you to get your journey started today. Now back to the show. Full without him here. But I will say one thing. What did you say? Without him here, editing the audio is a whole hell of a lot faster. Without oh, him gonna here. It's going to be real bad tonight. It's going to be bad. I can already tell. When you started cleaning your throat earlier, I'm like, fuck. Yeah, well, just keep his mic on. You're going to be contributing a lot this episode. Oh, yeah? But without him here, editing the video is the worst experience. It's the worst experience of all time. That's what it is. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. Did you do it, Chris? Well, he did the he did the actual cuts back and forth. By the way, he has OCD on the cuts. <laughs> you noticed, so right? if anybody's getting like <laughs> weird, like spinning or nausea from the back and forth from the last video, that's because Saeed went a little bit overboard. Yeah, I literally cut every time because the last thing I wanted was Chris <laughs> to come back and me be like, "Wow, Saeed, you're really fucking lazy, bro." Bro, it was like left, right, right, left, right, left, 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 left right, left, right. <laughs> <laughs> You go back like twenty episodes. I used to do that, and I'm just like, "What the fuck am I doing?" Just keep it at like. No, Dunda, he he understands the cadence of the show now. He understands that okay, if we're riffing, let's cut back both of us at the same time. I'm not there yet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I saw firsthand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sold. Say less. Yeah. So. Oh, and uh, wow, Arun is here today. That's it's so shocking. He needs to accrue more PTO. It's it's it's, 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 it's like he's running on E, dude. I'm so stunned. I don't even I don't even know how to do the intro now. Like I got to think of something creative to do. Listeners should know that this will be a fun episode. Oh, we are drinking with Kalen Twelve. Saeed rubbed his nubby little paws all over the ice cubes, but that's fine. Look, I'm not like you. I've got some weird antibacterial problem issue going on. I'm not a hypochondriac. You have admitted poured- on this on this show, Chris. This uh, this is not me airing out your dirty ass laundry. You've admitted on this show. From time to time, you may skip out on washing your hands. I did not say that. You ha- Christopher. I did not say that on this show. <laughs> oh, dude? I said Come on, there man. are certain parts of my body that are cleaner than other parts of my body. Hands, not one of them. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. You're not, you'll never touch one of my ice cubes, bro. I'll tell you right now. Put my ding ding on that ice cube. <laughs> <laughs> it's McKayla 13 tonight, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Starting off the show with the dick joke. That's not good. All right. Know, right. There's a lot of coughing going on back here too. Yeah, my, my, I'm not not doing too well post flu right now. I'm I'm like hacking up an iron lung. So the the good the good news is everybody is that Saeed's gonna be sick in about a week from now. <laughs> how do you like your flu? Uh, I'm you like that lingering cough yeah. again. Remember how long that lasted? God, that was annoying. That I you still did it last show. I know it came back. I think you like the step back. And yeah, then you like the whole cough. A, like a filtration system in here. Something. I actually have two of them in my garage. I was gonna bring them in. They're kind of loud though. No, just to do it like before and after. So clean it up a little bit. Humidifier in there. Yeah. No, a humidifier would be crazy. What the fuck is this wrong guy, with you guys? guys? My wife literally has a humidifier in every room. Every room. Every room. What the fuck's wrong with your wife? I don't. We only, Whoa. <laughs> oh, we only. Whoa. Nothing. She bro. married me, obviously, a lot. <laughs> we, uh, no, we only bust them out when the kids are sick. That's it. No, we have them in every room. Okay. She, my, 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 yeah, I, I will say this. My wife does have like flawless skin. So it's a whole thing. For oh, her. it's for the skin. I think it's just skin, breathing, atmosphere, the whole thing. I don't. We have know. to. We have to have them because, um, especially during the summer, Adam gets like bloody noses if we we don't do that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. In the mornings when he wakes up. In the morning when he wakes up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's really bad. So we That's have to. Good. We have to have a humidifier on. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, Arun, do you get any bloody noses? Not unless I pick them. You want? Oh God. Pick them. Jesus. That what? sounds like it's a real this problem. This show's getting off the rails. <laughs> it's going off the rails. Should we, we just get into it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's talk about, you know, penises or alcohol nope, or nope, bloody nope, nose or anything. We're good. We're okay, good. All, right, good. all right. Done with that part of the show? Yeah, yeah. Welcome to the number one financial literacy podcast in the world. Sitting next to me once, once again, who never goes on PTO. Never. The man, the myth, the legend. The one and only partner in crime, Saeed Omar. Oh, sitting next to me on my left is my partner in time, you said crime, so that's now you're, just, you're switching. You're seeing if I'm paying attention. Uh, yeah, I'm just very put off by Arun being here. I, it's thrown off my whole vibe. My partner in time, Chris Nahibi, also known as the world's greatest dad. 
Wait, where did that come from? <laughs> because you, you you did not listen to the last episode, Odin. Do you even work here, bro? <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> last episode, we were trying to talk about personal shit. And you know how that goes with, with Saeed. Oh, it's like, God, oh, let right. me tell you some personal shit. Hey, the other so day. I walked out of him to school. Can yeah, I was that? being the world's greatest father. And uh, <laughs> I felt so guilty about it. <laughs> <laughs> I took him to the movies. Come on, man. That's personal it gets. I said, son, look, I'm going to build you a movie theater. <laughs> That's the kind of person I literally said, What's your guilty pleasure? And he's like, I'm just, I'm such a good dad. <laughs> That's what I was, what he said. I was talking about my Instagram <laughs> algorithm, and it was a bunch of dad hacks on how to bond with your kids. That you know, when I'm not busy dadding so hard, <laughs> I like to research on how to dad harder. I was just being honest, man. God damn. Bro. That okay. way, that way, if anyone ever pops into my Instagram feed, they see that oh, he's only looking at dad stuff. Okay, he's good. That's what I do. Yeah, that that's that's not true, dude. No, it, it's I true. said, what's your guilty pleasure? That ain't it, bro. Yeah, bro, I know. You could have gone with like, oh, I love watching barbers cut hair. You went the whole, hey man, I, just... I used to I actually really used to be into, that, especially the beards. Yeah, and and then and then what happened? You became a dad. Yeah, <laughs> I became <laughs> a dad a and, and had to stop caring about my hair. Mm-hmm. Well, so Arun, again, one of the many things you missed up by not listening to or producing or working on at all the last show or the show before that. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're here. DJ Arun, everybody. Yeah. Behind the ones and twos. Yeah. Well, the one. I don't think we can afford twos yet. We always say it. We do say it. Does anybody really still get the reference of DJs anymore? Because I feel like DJs back in the days had turntables and now it's more like buttons. I, by the way, I went. I was at a wedding this past weekend, and somebody that I was at the wedding with was also an amazing father. <laughs> amazing father, this yeah. guy. Amazing of course, father, yeah. yeah. Shocker. Hopefully, someday I, we can have him as a guest on the pod. Um, but his next door neighbor is DJ Zed. I don't know who this is, but apparently it's a big deal. Fuck yeah, he you. He goes by Zed. <laughs> Zed, you motherfucker. I'm just being honest. He lives but... in like a twenty million dollar house in the fucking valley. <laughs> yeah. So that's his next and it's, door neighbor. It's a fucking beautiful property, by the way. I've been yeah. to Zed's house. Oh, you've been? Yeah. Oh, but before no. he owned it, but when it was listed, yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah, anyways, so this friend of mine now lives next door, and he's, I was like, oh, man, we need to get you on the pod. It is a beautiful fucking house. So your your friend's rich, is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, he's pretty well off, yeah. Yeah, he I, is not doing I, badly. I was like, I mean, you should be sponsoring podcasts. That's what you should be doing. Does he know that our minimum sponsorship's a million dollars now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, this is going to be a bit of a different show. Uh, not only is Arun present and functioning, but uh, we decided we would post a little Q&A on uh, social media. And in doing so, we got uh, an overwhelming response. And the prompt was twofold. Number one, you can name anybody you want us to look into. And we're going to use this as not necessarily an episode to talk shit, although I'm sure there's going to be plenty of shit talking to be had. But a way to show you how to vet people in addition to... Let's look at who you are looking at, and let's talk about them. Let's see if there's some legitimacy there. Yes. That being said, uh, there's also a second kind of motivating factor here. We also uh, pose the, the questions. If anybody had any questions in general, ask. But the, the winner will be the best question at the end of the night, and we will pick this person on the show, and that person will receive $100 immediately afterward. I think Odin should be in charge of that. Picking the best question? Yeah. Well, I think based on the discussions, it. based on the discussions that we have. Okay, I'm fine. Arun? works for me. We bestow upon you the one hundred dollars to do as you shall choose. Yeah. Fuck, I have to pay attention now. <laughs> That's why I That's did gonna it. That's going to be very difficult. <laughs> see why I did it now. Yeah, it's very difficult. Do you see what I did? At least I'll be listening to one show this week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe he's not going to hear any of the jokes where he insulted him, is he? <laughs> Fuck you guys. All right, so we're going to take a bit of a different tack tonight. In that, my partner in time. Mm-hmm. Will be uh, reading the questions and and I will be uh, prompting answers and a little bit of uh, due diligence and we'll see where this goes. Let's do it. You ready? Let's get into it. Let's start off with CV Jeff Z. Jeff, ask us to do thatch. I'm assuming they mean let's go into thatch and see if he is a uh, cash or trash, right? And yeah, no chance. Here, scared. But he's selling a recipe we both know doesn't work. What's the recipe? First of all, for the mm. listeners that don't know who it's that Thatch Nguyen, right? Thatch Nguyen. Thatch Nguyen. Big on Instagram, uh, heavy into the investment real estate space. So I personally know Thatch. 
Right. Uh, and I don't, I don't really broadcast that. So it's not someone's fault for not knowing that. So what he's re referencing is Thatch uh, does the mentorship course thing. And he actually uses the same service that a lot of scumbaggy people use on the internet to sell their courses. What, what do you mean? What service? There's an that? individual who sells like a third party back end who manages and helps set up the sales. So when you call, this person will, will sell you the program and then help put the program together with Thatch and them. Okay. It's the same guy who reached out to me that I, I introduced you to. So, I, I showed you the picture of and all so that. So what kind shit. of program is it exactly? What do you what do you get out of his program? I believe it's a mentorship mind mindset course that focuses on Burr, which is buy uh rehab. Buy rehab, uh rent and refinance and repeat. Yes. That that's that kind of model. So what does that mean? It means like you're buying you're buying a property. Um, you're rehabbing it, right? And then you ultimately eventually rent it out. Mm -hmm. Once you rent it out and over the course of, you know, a few years, it appreciates in value. You refinance. And what he means by refinance, you're taking cash out of the property, right? Some of the equity. Yeah. And then you're taking that money you took out because it's a loan and you can go now take that and put it on another property, AKA repeat. So here's what I'll say about Thatch. Thatch got on social media a couple of years ago, I think during the pandemic with uh, a guy who still works for him, uh, Lorenz. Uh, okay. and, and that these two put together basically a growth strategy for him that really worked on TikTok and on Instagram and it really blew, uh, blew him up and mm -hmm. it got him to where he's at today. Thatch is legitimate. He, he's a Vietnamese immigrant, came to this country with effectively nothing with his parents. Him and his wife are just good old fashioned, hardworking people. Okay. He started off as a real estate agent, knew that he had to start buying property to get out of this active income, wanted to get passive income. Got into building properties later later on. Lives up in uh, I want to say Seattle, yes, in, in the, that area. But the northwest, yeah, yeah. yeah. He'll, I'm actually going to do some collaboration work with him in the not too distant future when he comes on the Newport Beach next time. But yeah, that's as legit as they come. He's probably the only person that I know that does this shit that actually has a background that I feel warrants him being able to do it. Okay, I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I didn't know Thatch until maybe less than a year ago. Okay. And seeing some of the postings, I'm going to be honest, when he's talking about, like, look, if you want a Lamborghini, he's talking about buying a Lamborghini. I'm just like, come on, man. This ain't for everybody. You no, know? but he knows. So his his social media strategy is well curated by, again, Lawrence, the guy behind it. And that's why I said it, because I wanted you to break it down. Why does he do stuff like that? He knows clickbait works. Mm -hmm. He know, He knows, like, look, like, if my lifestyle is really what's going to sell it, then I'm going to sell it with that. He does have a Rolls. He does have, like, tricked-out cars. Like, he does he keeps have, it on. He keeps it honest, too. Yeah, I think he had a, a Ferrari that wouldn't start, and he had to yeah. talk about, like, somebody he needed somebody to come over. So it's not like he's renting these cars. And he interviews other entrepreneurs. He talks about some of his students that have been successful. He talks about his two kids and how he's setting them up. He's done a lot of charity, charitable work up there too, supporting some local uh, some local endeavors that I'm, I'm aware of that he, that he kind of gets behind and really pushes – he, he's a good dude. Do I, do I think that he's doing a cash grab with this? Yeah. But that's if you know him, that's what he does. He's going to find a way to make money no matter what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And now he's got the real estate stuff that's passive income. He does some active stuff. He still buys properties that, that, that he's going to buy and fix up. Yeah. But he certainly does the core selling too because it's easy money for him. And the method that he's teaching, that Burr method that we, we talked about at the top of the show with him, that, I mean, that is a legitimate method that a lot of people use. But I don't think it's going to work in the next economy. Agreed. I think in the next economy where values are going down, that is not a wise endeavor. And if you'll notice on his social media, and I don't know, I haven't talked about this, he's pivoted heavy from that mm -hmm. being his pitch to now, how do you get a $100 million portfolio? Let me tell you how I got here. Right. And I'll, we'll get into why I also agree with that later on the show, because I know there's another question that I semi prepped for um, on BlackRock's vision of the new regime. Oh, is that a question? I didn't even see that question. No, that's not a question, but uh, I'm going to like incorporate it and bring it in. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, Thatch, uh, Thatch is cash. I think he's he's a good guy. Yeah. So. Cash. Straight cash, homie. Next up, uh, this from uh, Christian Garcia, Mr. Thankful. I'm going to be honest. I did a quick, I tried to do a quick search. I went on YouTube just uh -huh. to see if I could go find what Mr. Thankful was. I'm pretty sure the two things that I found was not what this person was referencing. I don't so know who Mr. Mr. Thankful, Thankful is. is a guy on Instagram. Okay. That is not him, Maroon. Uh, is a guy on Instagram who uh, basically drives around giving away cash. Oh, really? Yeah. The problem is I zoomed in to three of his videos and looked at the cash. No. The money is not real in those videos. Oh, here you go. Does Mr. Thank... Oh, Mr. Thank? Mr. Thankful. Mr. Thank you. 
No, it's just... Maybe they meant Mr. Thank You. Yeah, Arun, you're having a real tough time, dude. He's literally the first profile on Instagram. But before you do that, let me just send you to the group messages here. All right. Which you need to see. So what he's known for doing what? He's known for... So he rolls up on people and gives them money. He's got these really outlandish uh, kind of displays of having cash everywhere around him. So Arun, uh, to the oh, studio... this guy right here? Let's see here. Yeah, yeah, let's have yeah There's a difference between Mr. Thankful and Mr. Thank You. So, yeah. Well, Odin does, didn't like that you called him out. <laughs> he didn't Christian like it. Christian Garcia, you don't win. No, it's Chris doesn't win. <laughs> Potato, tomato, <laughs> whatever. So, Mr. Thank You, I sent you some stuff to the studio, uh, the studio stuff. It'll 10 million do. followers, this guy? 10 million followers. And if you look at his videos, he basically rolls around with a big ass box of cash okay. and gives people what looks like one stack. Uh, of hundred dollar bills, which is about ten thousand dollars, if you look at the bank notes. But what's he selling? So that's the interesting part, right? So when you look at his profile, uh, it's kind of ambiguous. He's got a Spotify thing here. He's got some weird stuff going on. It looks like he's just trying to grow with outlandish behavior. Yeah. So I zoomed in on the videos. On all the videos, you'll find the cash has two commonalities. Let me see. Okay. On the first picture that Arun's pulled up, just uh, pick one of them. There you go. This, this one here is fine. In the top left of the bill, it says in, I think, some kind of European writing, Gezers or Deers or whatever. Oh, right there. Yeah, I see it. Basically, that is not U.S. real currency. It's fake money. This guy is crazy. So go to the next photo, Arun. This bothers me so much. So on the next photo, the one, so yeah, not only is it, it's the whole thing, it's staged. The next one that he's showing here, this one shows a bunch of stacks. Now, this doesn't have the fake money mark on it, but when you look at the serial number on all the bills, they're exactly the same. Oh. So the serial number on, on both these hundreds right here is PM two five seven eight two one eight one I, and they all have the same serial number. Yeah, and it also looks like the the strap of the ten thousands. That's not doesn't seem like the right color. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be something that's off. But whatever. Go to the next next picture. There's another one, clear as day from the video, top left corner there. Again, the German writing or whatever that it looks like, some kind of European writing. Yeah, that's fake money. Ay ay ay. And yeah. so people are buying into his shtick. And yeah, and it was crazy to me is he shows these these bills in absolute, like right in front of you, crispy video. And it was easy for me to grab a screen to grab of this. So he drives around. And he's like, oh, do you know who I am? Are you following me? Oh, here you go. Here's the money. So people are naturally following him because, like, oh, if I see him, he'll give me $10,000. Right, 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 right. And it's not true. What's interesting is I Mr. found Beast a, did that too for a little bit. Like, yeah, but oh, he was giving away real money. Yeah, he's giving away real money, but he would also, like, he would double you up if, like, you were also a subscriber. Yeah. So. That appears to be this guy's operation here, whatever the hell this is. But what's interesting, though, is I actually went down the path of looking at him on LinkedIn. This guy is like a motivational speaker, Man. like about, about thanks and appreciation and some like kind of gratitude weird and gratitude. And I don't know how this dovetails into it, but this seems to be his shtick. But frankly... I would say he's trash. It's all bullshit. It's yeah. not, it's not huh. legitimate. Yeah. If it was labeled for entertainment purposes only, that's fine. But to pitch it as you're driving by doing this with clearly fake money, it's it's kind of despicable in my mind. Look, for for the listeners out there, just to take you a little bit behind the scenes, Chris and I have had discussions on the show that where we feel potentially having conversations around structuring your mindset, is there's some little, little value there. But creating an entire show or channel around it seems like we're, we'd be profiting off of something that you know is a little unethical in our eyes especially when there's so many people that are that are misusing it now yes you know it doesn't seem like the, the we know some people out it. there in the space that are using it and they're using it for good and also not really profiting off of it right not monetizing it and they see that there is true value in it and you're creating a good you know community but for, for people like this come on man and Arun, this is him, right? John Israel. That looks it looks like him, but with shorter yeah. hair, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Thank you on LinkedIn, John Israel. And look, it was he's a gratitude specialist, like seminar guru type type guy. And it just seems so disingenuous that his Instagram profile is this guy. Right. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Next question. Next question. So trash. <clears throat> Somebody put in Chris Nahibi. Absolute trash. <laughs> this guy is the biggest piece of trash. It's fucking bullshit. Everything. The number one search thing, in addition to next to my name, so like it's your name and something for SEO purposes on Google, is Chris and Hebe parents. They want to know your origin story. No, they want to know if like somebody gave me money. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They did not give me money. Stop searching, you motherfuckers. Yeah. Well, not well. Also, like I mean, 
to your credit, you're not really out there showing off like I I make all this money. I know, which is weird. Like what? Like what? I'm not flaunting anything. I know, but yet here we are. Yeah. No. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of Chris. Absolute cash, cash money. Maybe she's got a hundred million dollar beard. No. <laughs> no. That's like okay. I just tried too hard. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, sorry. A little bit of a stretch. Yeah, it's just trying to be honest. <laughs> yeah. No. But um, no. I mean, look, he's. He's a licensed attorney, real estate agent, oh, real Christ. estate, go to the real estate broker, yeah, 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 uh, all, yeah, all the good stuff. Yeah, let's just skip that one. Yeah. Oh, man. Mr. Uh, Dom Landry. This guy loves – he's definitely Team Chris. Yeah, of course Dom is. Smart guy. <laughs> he knows. He knows what's up. He knows. He knows you could, you could roast me. He, he puts Saeed Omar. Trash. <laughs> I'm a good dad, bro. Let me have that. One of these days you're going to break down in here. What and do I'm going to get some real, like – Dirt on you. Can I be honest, man? Some Andy Cohen type real housewife shit from me. If I be honest, Go. since since uh, my kids have been on winter vacation, this is already not honest. I'm being honest. Okay. S since my kids have been on winter vacation, and we've been able, and remember, I took the first week off as p for PTO because we didn't have anybody to help watch the kids, mm -hmm. and then my wife took the second week, right? And then um, now this week is starting, and we're a little worried about what's going to happen this week because now we're going to let him go off to like. You know, my grandparents' house. Today he was at actually Odun's house and my daughter as well. But this last this last week, I think because he's received so much attention from us, he's been a night and day difference kid. Like, he's been acting per perfectly to the point where it's scary. Every behavior of his is absolutely perfect. And I'm just thinking, man, you're, you've been removed from all the bad influences probably around school. And you've maybe semi-forgot about them. Man, so you're telling us that you're such an amazing father that when he's around you, no, more, I think I know. I think what I'm saying is these kids at this age, man, all they all they really need is attention. They want your attention. They don't care about anything else. Yeah, okay, we all know that. Number you one. do? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I think we all know that. Yeah. No, I don't. I think a lot of, a lot of people want to enroll their kids in like some like activity or some you know after school program or during these winter breaks, spring breaks. I know a lot of parents that just enroll their kids into, like, some daycare service. I mean, some of which they have to because they don't really have a choice. But I don't know, man. Maybe if, you, if you're out there and you feel like some of your kids' behaviors are uh, <laughs> my, my dad preaching right now. This is so bad. This, I'm it's being so honest. Bad. No, this is, look, this is what I've been dealing it, with and seeing the, this oh last, the last two weeks. Arun, do you want to tell them that the, shtick, the dad shtick ain't, ain't working for the show? That's working. Oh God damn it! Your co sign I, I, I think, like that. I, I think, bro. I'm just saying, if if you feel like, of course you like it, Captain PTO. <laughs> no, this guy's also he's a great dad too. Yeah, he's with his kids all the time. All of us. All the time. <laughs> yeah, he's with them all the time. Next question. Um, okay, this from JMad93. Caleb Hammer. I don't know who Caleb Hammer is. I'm be honest, I don't know Caleb Hammer. Let's, Caleb uh, Hammer. Let's fire up the search engine here. Oh, Odin already had to teed away. Look, he knew we didn't know. This must be it. Two hundred thirteen thousand followers. Oh yeah, this guy. He's he makes a lot of appearances on the show called the the Money Guys. Yeah, that's right. What he does is he interviews people. Same thing like Dave Ramsey, where people will come to him with their uh, financial questions or maybe some troubles that they're in, and he'll break down like, okay, let me see what are your assets, what are your liabilities. I've seen him. Um, is the dude with the glasses? Oh yeah, 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 I know this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like if with, you, yeah, yeah, he's he's cash. He's good. Yeah, he's good. No, he's I think good. I, I think he what he's trying to do. Yes, there's obviously there's he does some, interview some suspect ass people though sometimes. Yeah, and I can't say that I can verify that the guests are 100 percent accurate, right? Like yeah. it's not it's not all show, but I think the information that he's putting out there and the content that he's putting out there is straight cash. Like he is educating within his style of format. No, I think he's good, and I like the way he I like the way he interviews people. But yeah, I do like it too. He's very like straight to the point. You know, let's let's like get to the meat and potatoes, right? But I don't know. I, I don't want to go off and say he's. Cash, I don't know if he's selling anything. So um, I just I know I'm that looking at his page right now. I don't, I don't think he's selling anything that I can see here. The style, uh, the content is really to like teach, you know, you know, financial literacy. I believe, dude, he's got eight hundred eighty-five thousand plus on YouTube, five hundred five thousand on TikTok. Yeah, that's the bulk of his. Uh, See, I look at guys like this, and I'm like, why are we doing better than this? Well, he just gets he gets right into the meat and potatoes, and he goes over, like, examples. I mean, we could look, we could totally do this if this is what yeah. the people want. He, he helps people master their money. Want to sign up? Just 97 bucks. Oh, come on. Is he too? 
Well, yeah. look, I mean, at the end of the day, if he's going to try to find a way to comp, you know, make money off this, but all, all you really need is someone that you trust as a mentor that you can feel like you talk to. They'll give you the raw, honest truth. Look, do you have high high balances on your credit card debt? He's I'm looking gonna, at I'll his tell you guests. Right. Like, none of his guests are really big names. I mean, other than Graham Stephan, who we had on. No, but his guests are typically uh, people who need financial help. So what you're getting is, like, huh. an interview with uh, someone that is asking for help. All right. I'm going to give him cash right now. Yeah. And 97 bucks for whatever the hell he's selling. Fuck it. That ain't that bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't know if there's, like, recurring charges, but. Yeah, he's cash. He's fine. Straight cash. Okay. Uh, this from our girl, Jackie Martinez. Jackie. Gangster. Uh, thoughts on Wellfront account? Oh. You know what Wellfront account is? Yeah. Um, okay. So basically, I looked this up before the show because I personally, I, I'll be honest, I didn't know. Mm. But uh, looks like it's an, an it's an app. It's one of the best socially responsible investing apps options if you're in search of low-cost automated portfolio management. That's from their actual website. Um so I, I believe what they help you do is create a portfolio and uh, there's low cost fees associated with it. Yeah, I've, I know a number of people who use something similar to this. I know a number of people who use things like Acorns, which we talked about on the show before. Uh, people who use like E-Trade, they have a very similar kind of methodology. I think Wealthfront, Wealthfront is more meant to be kind of automated full, like just set it once and forget it. Acorn has a lot of the similarity uh, to that. But the one thing with Acorns is that you don't really get to choose your investment mix. You just get to choose whether you want it to be aggressive or moderate, or you know, really conservative mm -hmm. as far as investment strategies go. But um, but what do you mean? So when you say like set it and forget it, what exactly are you setting? So the, this is really meant to be like a reoccurring investment structure. So it's really dollar cost averaging in whatever type of investment structure that you agree to set up in the beginning. Okay. So you invest a certain amount of money automatically every single month into the same reoccurring type investments. Right, and that's actually something that I feel like if you're if you're having trouble getting started, you know, one way to treat these type of accounts is to treat them like they are a bill. So if you, if you've gone through your budget and you know, you can set aside, even let's say it's something like a hundred or $200 a month, right? Treat it like going, you can go onto your online bill pay and have money transferred out. Yeah. Right. Every month automatically on a certain date. So it's just like a, a bill that goes out. So you can, it's actually dollar cost averaging. Yeah. Right? I'm a big fan. I think it's a, I think it's a great way to start. It just depends on yeah. what works best for you. I also like acorns for exactly the same reasons. So. Right. But um, I mean, I'm not. I'm I'm more comfortable with Fidelity myself, right? Mm -hmm. Fidelity and Vanguard. That's how I started off. Um, but it doesn't seem like a bad idea to me. No, it's good. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. This from uh, Vatek. Is that how you pronounce that? Uh, Alex Choi. <laughs> Alex Choi gets a lot of shit in um, on the internet because who is he? So he's a YouTube celebrity, if you will. He's really into hypercar, supercars, but he's very young. He's very forthcoming that he comes from a, a, a pretty wealthy, well-off family and that his it's family money. It's not like he's you know generated a lot of the money that got him started on his own. He, he's very transparent about that, but he does okay. some pretty crazy wild shit with cars. He's really into flying and helicopters and all sorts of other shit now as hobbies as he's gotten a little so bit older. So is the question out there that like this is this lifestyle isn't real? Well- Cash or trash? Number one, he's cash. He, he's not selling you anything. He's got a YouTube channel. If you watch his videos, good for you. That's what, it, that's what they're there for. That's the whole point. But that being said, he does some wild, crazy shit. He's totally destroyed his his, uh, uh, his Lamborghini and done some really wild shit to it. The most recent one was like he did like Christmas lights on it over the holiday. Oh, I saw that. That's him. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, him. Yeah, 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 yeah. But fucking great guy. Smart kid. Uh, he had a leg up. He doesn't hide that. And you know what? It's all views for him. He's not selling you anything. So I much like our guest Alejandro, right? Alejandro, yeah. Salamandrin, yeah. Right. I think it's pretty cool with guys that like have money and they're willing to spend it in like on things that they're interested in, and then they showcase it and they're yeah making and, money off it. Like and Alex is like very clear. Like, look, this is family money. It came from family money. Like, you know, is what it is. Now his YouTube channel's big size now, and he's making money off that. I'm sure. And I don't I don't know how much of that supports his endeavor, but he's a good kid, smart. And he's not hiding anything. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, he's 100 percent legit and cool. All right. Next up, uh, we got. Uh, how do you envision Bitcoin shaping the future of the real estate industry, and where do you see its trajectory heading into 2024? Well, first of all, let me just start off by saying I think they're fucked. <laughs> you know why? Why are they fucked? Your boy uh, Kramer. Oh no! You didn't see this. What did he do now? Oh, he was pimping the shit out of it after it crossed 45000 Again? 
He did it. He pimped it once. Dude. Then he got pimp slapped. You know what that means. It's fucked. It's fucked, bro. God damn it. Inverse Kramer to the moon, baby. Yeah, yeah. That, not a good sign. Uh, at one point in time, there was a company, and I can't remember the name of it. I want to say it was Proppy that was doing it, but that was trying to take uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and teach realtors about it mm. and give them a certification certificate kind of a thing that went along with it so they could be, you know, real estate and, you know, cryptocurrency and Web3 right. literate, if you will. Right. Uh, and there was a period of time where tokenized real estate may have been a possibility. As a matter of fact, I was asked to be on a board of a fractional real estate company, which I agreed not to do, but I also agreed to help them. What is what is that? What is a fractional real so estate? So they company? wanted to fractional fractionalize and tokenize real estate. So think of it as a real estate syndication where you get a bunch of people together to, to buy a piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. What they wanted to do is they wanted to do that in the form of being able to buy and sell it on the blockchain. Yes. So the, one of the problems with the syndication is let's say you go to Grant Cardone and you want to buy a piece of real estate. Okay. Your money's locked up for at least ten years, if not longer, according to the syndication terms. Mm -hmm. Not good for you. But let's say you want to access your capital. Well, in theory, if you were to tokenize it and securitize it then you could sell that interest on the blockchain to whoever wanted it, whenever they wanted it, for whatever they're willing to pay. Got it. So you can kind of make it an Ill illiquid investment, very liquid, without affecting the underlying real estate. And then if you bought my one-tenth of 1% 1 of that property that I own, you would then own that instead of me. The problem is, if there's a loan on the property, you're fucked. So now you have to not just syndicate the portion that you're going to finance, uh, so the, the down payment minus portion you're going to finance, you have to syndicate the entire value of it. Mm -hmm. No one's been able to really uh, figure it out and structure it well. I do think the blockchain is a future of title. So when you buy a Louis Vuitton bag, you buy a car, you buy a piece of real estate, it'll all wind up on a blockchain, so it'll be public record. But I don't think that tokenized real estate will happen in 2024. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Neither do I. Um, I think it's going to take some time to work its way through. Like, I think we talked about recently on a previous episode that a lot of these industries are really old and outdated and slow to to, to bring fucking on. monopolies man you have to yeah. understand a lot of these things are controlled by outdated associations and trade groups a great example of that is national national association of realtors who's had a strong arm on the industry thanks to their access and control over mls the multiple listing system they just got their ass handed to them in texas uh not texas in uh was it texas or whatever state it was they lost yeah. their their multi-billion dollar lawsuit but that's all going to change slowly, for sure. And it starts with that lawsuit, but it'll certainly bleed over into title, into escrow, and some other places where there's been certainly a lot of monopolies. So. Yep. All right. Next up from, let's see here, Vic Dominguez, I, I believe it is. Big Vic. Uh, meet Kevin on YouTube. Yeah. I had to look this one up. So Meet Kevin is either universally loved or universally fucking hated. He's a YouTube guy who tried to run for, I think, president at some point or, or some kind of local, not a president, but some type of local, like, political, I think it was maybe a senator or some shit. A senator? He tried to run for some kind of political office. I can't remember what it was, but uh, he had green hair or some shit during a period of time, too. Okay. I think what this guy is is a good marketer, and he's trying to really market and brand himself for... all. I mean, look, look he got a Wikipedia page. I mean, you know, he's not doing too bad for himself, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, born in Germany, he's only 31 years old, uh, yeah, really. Ventura College, and he went to UCLA, okay, and he's a Democrat. Yeah. So, 595 million views. So yeah, he's a great marketer, he's a great YouTube personality, I don't think he's selling anything, is he? Uh, it didn't look like it, and it looks like he's trying to make himself look wholesome, wholesome if he's exposing Grant Cardone. Well, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Right, it's not not that hard to do. They're all selling something, Chris. Come on, uh, yeah. introducing the gold membership. Fuck, really? What is he selling now? Join now for four hundred and thirty dollars. Let's see here. Get short to the point, crash course style information on what the most important topics highly applicable to today's economy. Oh fuck me! Yeah, come on, trash. Yeah, I mean, especially now, <laughs> trash. What is his fucking baseline for having? I mean. What gives him? What gives him that credibility? Is yeah, there anything yeah. in his? He's, what's his career path? Yeah, let's see what, what's going on. Does he have a LinkedIn account? Um, no, fuck his LinkedIn. Does he have any experience in finance? Is he an economist? His videos have discussed topics including real estate, the stock market, COVID nineteen, stimulus checks, cryptocurrency, and airline points. Mm. Great for you. Legal issues. There's a good section. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I would not trust this guy. Yeah, I would say. 
Just because he can research and repeat stuff on Google does not mean that he is a financial expert. He's 31 years of age, having never apparently worked in finance. I'm telling you right now, whatever he's selling you in that course, you can find online for free. Yeah, there's nothing there that's going to be proprietary. Trash. He actually came up a bunch of times. So this guy is a lot more popular than... No, oh, he's got know. a huge following <laughs> yeah. on YouTube, which pisses me off to no end. Here you go. Meet Kevin. What is this? He was a real estate broker at one point. Okay, so they, Jesus <laughs> fucking fuck. Yeah. They need literally to, nothing. <laughs> they got, he's got nothing there, right? Yeah, fund manager and advisor. President of his own company, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Real estate broker, president of Meet Kevin. YouTuber. Look, he should. So he's he should, a great marketer. He should be selling a if he's selling his a course on marketing. Maybe like he understands yeah. if he understands. He's showing you how he understands. Let me teach you how I grew my YouTube. Fine. Great. Sell that. Yeah. But you want to teach people about business and finance because you spent a couple of years doing this. For, I mean, come on, man. Yeah, man. No. No. Trash. Trash. I don't want to meet Kevin. Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Fuck you, Kevin. Fuck you, Kevin. Close the fucking door. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. What should investors be prepared for coming into the new year? This from Vic Ramirez. Mm. Uh, I just gave a similar interview to that effect. Uh Mm. And I'll boil it down quickly in the interest of time to my kind of big underlying concept. Most people think that the real estate market has upward mobility at this point in time because they're like, okay, the Fed funds rate is going to get cut. And when they do that, you're going to see mortgage rates drop. I don't believe that's the case. What I think is going to happen is the treasuries, particularly the 10-year treasuries, are going to come out of the yield curve inversion, forcing upward pressure on mortgage rates, which means that home values will not rise the way everybody thinks it will. As a matter of fact, I think... Redfin's predicting to go down next year. Yep. Yeah. And even the National Association of Realtors is, is pretty um, bearish, if you will. Right. Um, that being said, I think that you're going to wind up seeing deposit rates go down and uh, you're going to see money start to compete in places like the Treasury, places like the stock market. But I think we are entering into a period. So 14 years, artificial interest rate deflation, Right. Really, really prosperous economy for 14 years. Mm -hmm. Typical prosperous economies last about 7 to 10 years, and they're followed by about 7 to 10 years of recessionary economies. I think our mistake as a society has been, oh, my God, soft landing. Look, we made it through. It's only been a year or two since we started raising rates, and everything's fine. No, no, no. Okay, that would be ignoring 400-plus years of economic data. I think what's in store is a very challenging, very volatile time that will come to be known as the Great Correction. Yes, and we coined that on the episode that Odin did not listen to. He wouldn't know. Yeah. First time he's ever heard it. <laughs> he wouldn't know, right. Yeah. But so I wanted to bring this up earlier. Odin, if you could please Google the 2024 global outlook from BlackRock. Oh. So uh, this is a report that they release every year, okay, mm -hmm. at the end of every year, and they give you an outlook onto the upcoming year. Why you should care about BlackRock. They're the largest asset management company in the world, right? I think just under $9.5 trillion. In, they got a couple of coins. <laughs> they kind of know what they're doing over yeah, there, they, they, right? They and a couple, a couple and something that they pointed out, yeah, just go ahead and accept all. <laughs> so the this uh, this article is called um, "Grabbing the Wheel: Putting Money to Work." So if you can go ahead and click that link, Odin, please read our yeah, perfect. You really, what this? they what they talk about is the um, based on the higher interest rates that we're dealing with now, and what the Fed has said higher for longer, mm -hmm. and the volatility that is currently in place you can pretty much bank in some rocky roads ahead here it goes starts by saying the new regime of greater macro market volatility has resulted in greater uncertainty and dispersion of returns right so it, they, it's very unclear what will be prosperous in the upcoming year and the upcoming years to come and well, if, let me explain that in a little detail so everybody understands i'm gonna make it sound as simple as possible without getting technical, okay? If the stock market's at a super fucking high value, mm -hmm. right? Not speculation, that's real. Right. If the real estate market's at a super fucking high value, not speculation, that's real. We can go all over the past episodes and, and give you examples and reasons as to why that's true, but it's true. Do you really believe that it's just going to keep on going up in perpetuity? That's silly. And if the Fed has said we're going to keep rates for higher for longer, but yet you have Chicago Mercantile Exchange, World of Straight Probability, and everybody talking about a 90% approximate uh, possibility, probability of mm -hmm. a rate cut in the first meeting in March, right? So 
I would say that you're you got some really really weird things that are going to happen. Okay, the Fed's going to watch the data that comes out between now and then. Right. Going to watch GDP. Going to watch inflation. Going to watch employment. Right. And those numbers aren't going to pivot one way or the other too too much. And if they do, I hope it supports the idea of cutting rates. And even if they do cut rates, that doesn't mean we've solved the problem. Because one of the things the Fed has said multiple times, and people want to just completely ignore, is the markets, all the markets, are overvalued. If you don't have a correction in the markets, you have a much, much, much bigger problem than inflation. And maybe one of the reasons why they're saying that they're overvalued is if there is a correction, they have a leg to stand on when they said, we told you it was overvalued, mm -hmm. and we're not going to cut ra slash rates when they there is a correction because we believe this is where they should be. Yeah. Right. Um, one key point in this is this is a, a, an amazing thing uh, for you to read. I will plug it in the show to, for you if you have time to go in and check it out. But if only if you scroll down a little bit, the first portion of this is context is everything. Stop right there, please. Um, it says here that um, in contrast to other major economies, the U.S. grew at a robust clip in the third quarter of 2023. Remember what they're referencing there is the Q3 GDP figure that initially got posted at 4.9% and then got revised up to 5.2%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Core inflation has fallen sharply. Okay. It's come down a lot. So people are thinking, okay, we're in the clear. A soft landing may be possible. Right. And nearly 7 million new jobs have been created since January of 2022. So people are excited about the amount of jobs. We're in a robust economy. Everything is great. But to their point, context is everything. Look at this chart right here. That figure on the bottom, if we, all the job creation that we've seen so far has just been us climbing out of the hole from the pandemic. So two things for people to think about when it comes to jobs, okay? Because I have long believed that jobs and the jobs report are bullshit. Mm -hmm. I have long believed that private payroll numbers are absolutely fucking useless. Not to mention that the jobs numbers that have come out have been revised multiple times down. Right. In almost all cases in the last eight months. That being said... You look at, we do have people who have two jobs. Yes. You do have an older subset of individuals working longer than they had historically. People with 55, 65 would retire. Now, they don't retire anymore. They keep working. Mm. So you don't have these people that are leaving the job market like at the cadence that you once did. Well, they can't afford to, right? Like, I think more than 50% of people that are of retirement age have $0 in retirement savings. Mm -hmm. How many older people are doing things Maybe not working a traditional job, but are working like Uber or Postmates. Yeah, right. You know, they count as full-time employed. They do. But, but the what this chart really explains here is, had we, had we never experienced a, a pandemic, the job creation that would have been happening on a steady growth, where we are at now is still below where we should have been. You know, I just thought of something. And uh, I think we'll have to figure this out on a different episode, but... If you're a person who is full-time employed at a bank, mm -hmm. but then you also work Uber on nights and weekends, is that two jobs? Yeah, it would have to be, right? So then are you showing up as taking two jobs? Oh, what, on the census? On the census. I mean, I don't know how many of those people are actually reporting, you know? I mean, what if they're not reporting? What if Uber's reporting? Yeah, that's right. You know, and what and they if, are reporting on the jobs report, yeah. actually. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, maybe that, that's got a lot more girth to it than we realize. Yeah, exactly. A lot more width. It can carry of, a lot more weight. But actually with some depth as well. Well. Girth and depth don't really go hand in hand. Unless. There's two hands. There's two hands. Unless there's two hands. It's true. <laughs> All right. That was so good. All right. Um, Carl Icahn, does he live up to the hype or just a Wall Street bully? This from Oof. Kevin uh, Comto. Oh, Carl Icahn is probably the most famous activist investor of all time. There's a great Netflix special, at least it was on Netflix at one point in time, about him and his life uh, where he's actually featured in it, talking about some of the things that he's done. Mm -hmm. in his career activist investors are either loved or hated and it's really hard to tell a good and a bad one but as much as he might have a reputation for being a bully and being just hyper aggressive it's clear that he's fucking brilliant mm -hmm. that he's talented 
and that he's amassed a fortune based on the skill set that he has. According to uh, Forbes, the most trustworthy website of all time, <laughs> uh, $5.6 billion net worth. Yeah. yeah, so look, he's probably loved by many shareholders and probably despised by many employees. Some, yeah. I mean, this is a guy who would walk into you know large shareholder meetings and say, you know, what the fuck do you do for a living to you know, middle management? Yeah. Like, you know, why do you need like six secretaries and shit like that? I mean, he would just ask very common simple questions, but he's hyper aggressive. He would bully his way onto boards and he would do things that he thought was best. Now, the, the question is, is, is an activist shareholder really representing the best interest of the shareholder and trying to maximize the growth of the company? And is it the best thing for the employees? No, those things are sometimes counterintuitive. But it I guess it really depends, right? You got to think if he's coming in over the top and investing tens of millions of dollars into a company, mm -hmm. right? It's not like he's doing it, wanting it to fail. So this right? is this is not an example of what Saeed does where he says he wants to be the world's greatest father. This is a, this is a, me actually opening up on the show. So take notes, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. this, this right. You feel you ready? Ready. Okay. Hit me with it. So it is no secret if you, if you Google my name, you will find that an activist investor personally came after me and our company. And with no disrespect to the activist, you know, I, I have a reason to have animosity towards activist investors as a result of it, right? I felt like my name was besmirched in the process and that I was personally attacked for a number of reasons you can find if you Google it online. The filings are all with the SEC. Happy hunting. That being said, I've got nothing but fucking respect for Carl Icahn. I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for what it is that he's done throughout his career. I think he does live up to the hype. I think you should watch the documentary mm -hmm. and love or hate activists for what they are and, and what they do. Right. It is not uh, an easy thing to do. And there's not uh, something that something. It's just not something that everybody can stomach. It, it's not an easy job to do. This guy was such a big deal. Okay. Before the Joe Rogan bump, you heard of the Joe Rogan bump, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas like, if you make an appearance on the Joe Rogan show, Joe Rogan, yeah. Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan, right? then you probably get a bump in whatever industry or field that you're in, whether you're a podcast host or whether you're a comic or whether you're selling a book, whatever, right? Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. There's a Joe Rogan bump. Before the Joe Rogan bump was coined, you mm -hmm. know what was out there? What? The Icon Lift. Uh, is that like the pussy lift? <laughs> Not no, <laughs> the opposite of a pussy lift. But the Icon Lift was legitimate. If he was seen to have bought into a company, the stock price typically would go up. Because they knew that that he was going to find a way to monetize. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a little fun fact for everybody. And ironically, he's not selling a course like me, Kevin. Who knew? <laughs> you know why he's too busy out there becoming a fucking billionaire, real billionaire. Yeah, not like this fucking. Not the guy who goes onto Forbes and goes, "I'm a billionaire." Let me tell you why. <laughs> Put me on the cover next yeah. to Sam Bakeman Fried. <laughs> <laughs> as long as Jim Cramer says it's true. <laughs> By the way, Jim Cramer also said we we've now successfully attained a soft landing successfully yeah we, we have we've got it the fed was successful we have a soft landing done i was like well jerome powell, the economy <laughs> jerome powell your job here is done yeah why don't you just tell jerome powell you fucking hate him yeah yeah all right uh nick from reventure mm. that from rob c from sd what did you just call me yeah oh nick nick from reventure nick Gurley. well dude we've covered this guy on the show before i don't nick, remember nick why really yeah, we've covered him on the show before. Nick from Reventure. His name I, is Nick Gurley. I, I want to say he he gave the pod a, a shout out. Did he? I want to say. Huh. Yeah. Let's see here. Let's, yeah, let's see. Does he have an Instagram page or Did you pull it up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this guy. Remember him? Yeah, he gave us a shout out, didn't he? He did give us a shout out. Yeah. So he's a fucking genius. He's fucking good in my book. Yeah, he's <laughs> solid. No, let's see. What is he? Let's see. His most recent post six hours ago. He's talking about Redfin Home Buyer Demand Index, a measure of interest in showing and other home buying services is still at the lowest level in four years, down six percent from last year, an already low level of buyer demand. Great. Yeah, he's putting out real data out there. He's got stuff out there from Fred as well. Yeah, former underwriter. Former underwriter. I mean, yeah. he's part of my gang gang. Yeah. He's he's a consultant now. Yeah. I'm all in. We love Nick. He's a consultant now. Yeah. Yeah. Unless unless Nick, there's something out there about Nick that we don't see here. I'm not uh, I'm not hyper concerned with what I'm seeing here. Oh, we'll give, we'll give him the cash. Cash. Straight yeah. cash, homie. Um, this from uh, Michael VTV. Hmm. So many to choose from, haha. -ha. How about me, Kevin? All right, we covered him. Yeah, sucks. All right, uh, this Ass. from uh, Isabel. What's up, Isabel? She's a big uh, listener from the show. She came on from Mind Pump. Mm. Um, 
What would y'all's rap names be if you made it in the industry? Mm, yours would be Cool Daddy, right? Or Good Daddy. Dude. For, I'm sure it's not Puff Daddy these days. <laughs> <laughs> not these days. <laughs> Sir Dad a lot. <laughs> Wow, dude, you coughed on a hot mic? Yeah. Jesus right. Christ. Yeah, this guy's confidence is rising. <laughs> With, like, no hesitation. I love it. This is my podcast, bitch. Sir Dad a lot. Oh, doing it. What would yours be? Hollywood. Hollywood. That's a pretty good name. Why would it be Hollywood? Because that is one of his nicknames. Currently. Like, like the Florida Hollywood, right? Not like the LA Hollywood. <laughs> no, it's Hollywood. Why? Where did that nickname come from, Odun? Why did they start calling you Hollywood? Uh, I think it's... Uh... Hogan, right? Hulk Hogan. They used to call him Hollywood at one oh, point. Oh, Hollywood Hogan. I am yeah. wildly confused about the reference oh, now. Wrestling. Uh, who's Hulk Hogan? Is he the- <laughs> no, I know who Hulk Hogan is. You fucking dick. I just don't understand why anybody would, would confuse you with Hulk Hogan. Uh, no, uh, I was a bad guy at one point. Oh, uh, he was a bad guy at one point. And he's referen- They're referencing Hogan from NWO days. You wouldn't know. See the fact. No, that I he- know when he were all black and he was part of the weird crew, and then he did the whole like personality flip thing. I get it. Yeah, became yeah. the heel. The, the heel, yeah. No, all right, there you go. I, only because I watched The Rock, I understand what that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would your name be? I, Come on, I, let's give it to him. Let's give it to him, Odin. Oh. oh, I got it. Go ahead. What do you got for me? I got it. It's going to be racist, isn't it? God the, damn it. <laughs> little Gold Bloom X. A little Nas X? A little play on there? No, I got the, the Gold reference. Bloom with the glasses? That's, yeah. That's, I, mean, oh, I like it. Little Gold Bloom. Of course you like it. You're on his side today with everything he said got, today. One of us has to be a little something. That's you. Why is it got to be me? I'm clearly not little. That's the whole point. It's a play on the word little. Name one little person that's because actually then, because not that's, little. That's what made, that's not Little Bow Wow is little. He's little. Everyone's little. That's, but that's the problem. The, but that's the point, right? Then people will be, it'll, it'll trigger the algorithm. People start commenting about it. He's not a little. No. Okay. Nah, bad, 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 bad. Bad, bad. I can't believe you haven't given this more thought on your personal time. I thought you had one ready. <laughs> no, I was never. You strike me as the just doesn't want to say it. You strike me. Oh yeah, come on, tell us no. what Joanna oh, calls you, you in bed. Santa Ana. <laughs> what she calls me in bed? Yeah, I know it's a rap name. Come on, give it <laughs> An to me. Asshole. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh man, you went to Westminster. Come on, Westminster. You, those fucking racist. <laughs> <laughs> Westminster. Westminster. It's not a minister. It's Westminster. All right. <laughs> Uh, again from Michael VTV, Logan. Uh, that's your. I don't know how to say his last name. Oh, <laughs> Logan from Housing Wire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Logan is legitimate. He is a great economist for Housing Wire. However, uh, to be full disclosure, Logan does have a very, very heavy industry slant towards the housing industry and the real the realtor space. That being said, we he's engaged me in some pretty healthy debates, despite the fact that I'm an asshole in bed as well. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> can you see a world where it, because he's so heavy in the real estate, is he like when he makes these appearances, is it known from him that he needs to provide some level of optimism? No. Uh, or he really believes he's drinking the Kool-Aid. That is his audience. I will say I do have one bone to pick with him. His hair? No, his hair's fine. I'm fucking jealous. It's great hair. All right. Um, uh, he does like to rep that the Housing Wire podcast is crushing it, right? Uh-oh. But it's in some obscure random ass category and like, it's not doing as well as our podcast. I like is. I like I like what's going on. Can we start podcast beef? Let's do this. We don't need to start a podcast beef. We own the beef. We we, we own the beef, dude. We are the beef. I feel like okay, if I'm being honest, I feel like he's one of those individuals that is He gets a, great media coverage too. Big national syndication interviews, great, all that shit. Yeah. yeah. He's got But our podcast is better. His subject matter expertise is real estate, right? Yeah. And he's one of those people that I believe is too close to the paper and just needs to pull the paper back a little bit to read it all. He works for the real estate industry. He's very, very pro real estate industry. Yes. I think he has a real tough time with his bias, which he never discloses openly. Okay. Yeah. Let's try to get through these now. We're approaching 53 minutes. I'll go as long uh, as it takes, baby. This from Amber. If you inherit $80,000, what would you do with it? Pay taxes. I would pay taxes. <laughs> yeah, not everyone is in your Pay taxes right away. Set aside the money for taxes. No, after that. Hopefully it's in a family trust. I would pay taxes and then half that would be pay my Amex bill for the month. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, seriously, though. Um, um, if you have, first of all, if you have any. Uh, I credit card debt, definitely tackle that first, right? So 
old school logic here, but I think it works, still plays, okay? Think of your, your life in a couple different ways, right? You're going to think about your really, really expensive high debt, credit card debt, right? Stuff that's going to cost 20% plus a month. That's bad. No matter where else you put the money, it's going to be really hard to try to make better sense out of paying that down because that's costing you a lot of money. Then you got your kind of your mid-level debt, your longer-term debt, your mortgages, your car payments, your student loans, right? If your student loan payment's at 7%, 8%, meh, it's going to be tough to beat that in the market, and you're paying a monthly payment on that, but it is amortized over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. There are those who would say, take that money and go buy a piece of real estate, you're going to make money in equity appreciation, plus you'll make some cash on cash return. In this market, if you can get 6 to 8%, you're probably good. 6 to 8% cash on cash return is about even with your loan debt if you're like 7 7.5%. Yeah. So I can see the argument where it goes both ways, but think of that debt if you got an auto loan debt that's higher or you got a large car payment. It might be You might be considering paying something off in that spectrum, okay? Mm-hmm. Not necessarily a good or bad way to do it, but if not... I love going into real estate. I love finding a piece of cash flowing real estate that's going to make you some money every single month. With $80,000, for example, back in the day, I used to be able to buy at least two properties in the Midwest for that. They would pay me somewhere between, call it, eight to $900 a month at the time. Uh, free cash flowing, maybe about $400 a month each, which is $800 uh, a month in total. Would you have to go in 10%. and rehab any of it? No, I always bought after 2003 builds, a fully turnkey, never really rehabbed anything. I just don't have time. To do that, when I buy a property, I'm still working, doing all this other shit. Like, I don't have time to even focus on it. I have people out there who can do that for me, but I don't want to mess with it. I'd rather just buy something that's, you know, 2003 or later. All right, so given where we are now and where, where we see the market going and mm-hmm. where we see interest rates going, we know now that that 80000 probably won't be able to afford you two anymore, mm-hmm. right? So you'd have to put more down on one. Yeah. Um, given that it's a 30-year investment right? Because you're getting a 30-year loan on it. Um, Is that still something you would look into doing just because it's maybe a little bit safer, something you're comfortable with versus maybe investing it in some, if you know you're not going to touch the funds into some long-term investments? So this is the number one question I get a lot from both sides of the aisle, whether you're pro real estate in 2024 or you're against real estate in 2024. This is the number one question I get. I answer for the media. I answer on social media. I answer all the time. People believe that real estate value is going to go up. So they're like, look, even if it goes down, it goes down incrementally, let's say 1%, just buy. Mm. Buy. Chris, why are you telling people to wait? I tell people to wait on buying real estate right now because I'm just really uncertain about what comes next. And I don't like telling people to go do something when I'm very uncertain about what what happens in the next 6 to 12 months. Yes. And because nobody's got a crystal ball, nobody really knows for sure. But what I will tell you is in some economies, some markets – You've got a whole lot better of an understanding of what's more likely than you do right now. You got a, all sorts of geopolitical conflict, Israel, Israel, Palestine. You've got certainly what's going on with Russia, which is escalating with the Ukraine. You've got Iran apparently attacking some U.S. warships in, in the Mediterranean and all sorts of other places out there. So there's a lot going on. Plus, you got to never a, know what can happen over in China lo- and Taiwan. China and Taiwan, for sure. You got a looming election. You got North Korea doing some weird, uh, you know, drills and shit. It's all bunch. It's so much going on. Then election year, then you got fed rate cuts, which may start. There's there's talk about another fear of a bank run because the rate cuts might not drop rates. So people think, and then Mm -hmm. there could be a fear of liquidity in the markets again. So all that uncertainty, all that turmoil, I think you wait. I think you go into a CD for at least six months, maybe 12 months and you let that money mature for a little bit. And then you look and see where the market's at six to 12 months from now before buying a piece of real estate. My humble personal opinion. Yes. I'm risk adverse. Everything I do in my life is about mitigating risk. So take that with a grain of salt. I'll say, and if you, let's say we do see the other side of that coin where values actually do go the other way and do start to incrementally creep up. I don't see a situation where they creep up the way they did over the last two, three years, where there's going to be a, an increase of 40%. Let's no. just say or, if know. that happens, we are all fucked. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So like let's just say you're on the wrong side of this equation and it does creep up, you know, several percentage points. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you, you made the safer choice, you played it out, and okay. You're still getting into a long term investment because it is an investment property, anyways. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh let's see here. Um, uh, this from Zane Tarpo, uh, Greg Knuckles. What? 
That's a name. I, I was like, uh, is he trying to set me up? All right, what do we got here? 92,000 followers. Okay. Uh, he's a drug free power lifter, uh, fitness writer, nerd. That's him calling himself a nerd. Don't attack me. Uh, dog lover. If you want to get in touch, please use email or FB messenger. Let's see. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to call it what it is. All right. I got my guys over in mind pump already. Yeah. I don't really need anybody else. I don't know who Greg is. I got to be honest. Uh, he seems like he's posting some interesting things, but uh, yeah, I, I got to tell you, I got better sources. No disrespect, Greg, um, mm -hmm. that I like to rely on. Yeah, he's not selling anything. I already looked him up. Okay, not selling anything. I mean, that's, that's a good start. So you yeah. know what? If you find his information useful and it helps you lose weight and stay motivated, then fuck it, knock yourself out. Uh, I really think that Sal, Adam, Justin, and Doug, the Mind Pump guys, are the one-stop non you know, bullshit, non-biased place to go. Yeah. Uh, I also like Lane Norton for a lot of, like, no bullshit, and straight up, like, science. And we know them personally. The shit that they're selling over there, first of all, works. Yeah. Their programs work, oh, right? Yeah. And on top of that, you know, they vet out all, anything that they're selling on the show, they all use and they vet out. Yeah. Andrew Huberman's a great, another, another great example. Yeah. Uh, Peter Atia uh, is a great example of another science-based guy. Yeah. There's a lot of really, really big names out there who are fucking phenomenal. I just don't have the energy and the space to bring somebody else into my trust fold. Yeah, exactly. Do you have space in your trust fold? Say? <laughs> yes. There's always space. It's very warming. Yeah, it is warm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, this from Christian Garcia again. Okay, Christian, I see you out here trying to get this $100. You throw some money at some people. Also <laughs> to use some questions. The guy's name on IG is Mr. Thank You. Oh, we went over this. Yep. Trash. Straight trash, homie. All right, uh, this from uh, Rockstar Rudy, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts on the Gold Rush Rally Crew? I'll be honest, I looked this up. I felt like this was right up your alley, given your thermal experience. No, I, look, I, I know the Gold Rush Rally. Uh, a lot of respect for what they do. There are people in any event of an organization like this that are going to be great people, good people, ethical people. What There's, is it exactly? What are we what are we dealing with here? Effectively, it's it's just a rally where they get a bunch of cars together and they drive from, you know, one part of the country to another part of the country. It's usually across the country or half the country. Uh and it's a bunch of hyper cars and exotics. It's it's a really interesting time. They kind of party along the way. They get some speeding tickets along the way. It's yeah. a, it's certainly a a very different lifestyle and it takes a lot of money to get involved. It's not a cheap endeavor. That being said, it's like a club. A lot of people in the exotics and high-end car community will will kind of get together and do these things, and it's a great time for them. And look, it's not like this is an organization that recruits members. It's it's people pay to join and take part of these events. Mm. So there's going to be some great people. There's going to be some not-so-great people. There's going to be some, you know... Farmington? Yeah, there's interesting interesting things that happen here. I have nothing bad to say about Gold Rush Rally. I think it's spectacular. Uh, but I don't think that everybody in the organization is on the same level from an ethical and business perspective. Just know that uh, they are what they are, and, and you've got to use your best judgment when you try to make friends with somebody. You know? Dude, back in the day, did you ever go to those uh, street races? I street raced at some of those street races back in the day. So I did too. I not I did not street race myself, but I went to go watch as a visitor. Oh, I used to I used to go to them all the time. Right, and um, man, I've seen people give up pink slips. Like that shit is real. Like that. Yeah. That Fast and Furious life, that shit was really happening back then. No, I, I I grew up in that subculture. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember going. It was the first one that I ever went to, and then the cops showed up. And I didn't know, right? I obviously knew what they were doing was wrong because they were all hiding, right? They're on the freeway. Everyone's were you still an amazing dad back then, too? <laughs> I was. <laughs> I know, but I was talking about AARP. Yeah. So it <laughs> all kind of makes sense. Yeah. And then the cops showed up, and next thing you know, everyone just splits. One guy clipped a cop on on that was on his feet. Oh, they, they, it's like the cockroaches when the light turned on. Yeah. So listen, so they all every, just fucking poof, disperse. Every, and I didn't know any better. Nobody, nobody warned me. Nobody told me, "Hey, be careful of this." Right. So everyone just splits. The person that took me to the event, he split. Right. And I'm like, I'm just following him. I'm running. We're jumping over fences. There was barbed wire. I'm cutting my hand. I'm like, what are we doing? We're we didn't do anything wrong. Can we just stay? And we're hiding out in a bush, waiting for the cops. helicopters are showing up. And we just we just stayed there till like two o'clock in the morning until it all died out behind some bushes. I'm like, is this really necessary? What's going on? Did you bring your ARP card? Just show them. I was like, I'm a good kid. I'm retired. God damn it. I got I got straight A's. Come yeah. on, please let me. I'm know. trying to raise children. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Next up from uh, 
Uh, Josh, looks like Joshua. Thoughts on Dave Collins' case for a multi-decade bear market outline in his 2023 year in review. Well, it goes along the <coughs> same lines as, what, is everybody coughing tonight? I just thought I should interrupt you. Okay, well. Dave Collin looks like he's been around the game. Yeah, he's he looks salty AF, bro. Yeah. He's... Uh, look, I, I don't necessarily disagree with some of the logic. I think multi-decade is a you know bit this harsh. Huh? You, know this, you know this guy? I don't know him, but uh, I, I've seen at least a little bit of this, and I read and prep for the show. Okay. Uh, I, I will say I think he's clearly aggressive on his stance. Now, I do think his underlying premise is right. 14 years, artificial interest rate deflation. You're going to have a longer, more painful correction, and it's going to take... We're, the problem is we're looking for these really quick, fast corrections. Okay. Because the old ideology was as technology gets more and more robust, these economic periods go from you know boom to loss back to boom quicker and quicker and quicker. So what used to be a seven to 10 year cycle will now be a two to three year cycle and two to three year cycle, will then come a one year cycle. And it's going to be like, it'll be prosperous recession, prosperous recession, super quick. And it won't be as deep and as bad. Mm -hmm. Right. I think he's trying to make the case here that that's not accurate in that. What we've really been experiencing is a prolonged period of prosperous activity and to be followed by a very dark, long period of recessionary activity. I think that's a bit of extreme, I think you start to see cycles. I think we went through a long cycle. I think you see a longer cycle on, on the downward swing, and mm -hmm. I don't necessarily disagree with him. I don't think it's going to be as long. I do disagree with that. But, uh, yeah, no, you know, his theory is as good as anybody else's theory right now. It's all speculation until some shit happens. I mean, a lot of companies have been created over the last 14 years. I feel like with what's to come, we know a lot of the commercial real estate debt, right, is, and some of the business loan debt, that's like – they're on 30, that's a 30 year investment as well, 30 year product, mm -hmm. right? And a majority of it is on five years, right? Yep. So if somebody got a loan back in 2018 and you wake up in 2023, you got a fucking problem on your hands. Now, if you got that loan in 2020 and in the next two years, you're still dealing with higher interest rates and you haven't really positioned yourself to be well capitalized and interest rates are still higher, you have a problem, you know, two years from now. So, it's going to be a problem, and I don't see us having the upswing of companies and corporations being made and created and new jobs being created over the next, you know, five to ten years the way we've seen over the last 14 years. Yeah. It's fair, right? Yeah, fair. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, this is from C. West, 25. Long-time supporter of the show. I recognize this name. Uh, what does the next 10 years look like if there is a soft landing or no recession? Oof. Um, okay, you're going to see a growing divide between what will ultimately become the working class, which is currently made up of 52% of the population that is now known as the middle class and the lower class and the roughly 26% of the population that's the upper class will continue to grow. And what you'll wind up having is a working class and a wealthy class. Because if home values continue to rise and first-time buyers can't buy and the overwhelming majority of people's net worth is built in the equity appreciation over time in their homes, you don't have a net worth being built. Mm -hmm. <coughs> God damn it, you guys got me <laughs> going not too fuck. Got what's, what's happening? God, yeah, we're just um, so I, I, think, I think you wind up having a really, really bad set of circumstances. I, I think, unfortunately... That's what happens if you don't have a recession, if you have a soft landing. I think um, you've got a potentially really, really catastrophic change to the dynamics of, frankly, U.S. history. Mm -hmm. And it's fucked up to me. I'm going to get on a, on a bit of a soapbox here. Um, the whole ideology of the United States was formed that we didn't like and didn't trust the former government. So we, we as a country, separated from a government and a political system which didn't understand us anymore. And I look at where we are today and I think to myself, we have a government that doesn't understand us anymore. You've got Nancy Pelosi and so many political officials who make modest salaries who are worth millions of dollars. Mm. This is the same type of tyranny that we escaped as a new country. And yet here we are in the same 
fucking set of circumstances we were as a country when we created the country. Mm. And I think if, if we don't have a correction and we don't fix what's really the bigger problem in society, you're going to wind up with a big divide that's going to ultimately create the same kind of consternation that led to the United States in the first place. Everything we're doing now as a society, and social media is being the big prompter of this, is making us more distracted, more divided, and more sexualized. Yeah. And what happens when you have a more distracted, more divided, more sexualized culture? Fights. Fighting happens. Mm -hmm. People pick sides. Yeah. I, I have. It's a grim, grim outlook, and I know it's a terrible answer to the question, but... I, I honestly truly believe that we will get a correction, but that being said, I believe we absolutely fucking need a correction. Because if we don't get a recession, and we've brought this up on previous episodes, that you know it's it's a cyclical process, right? It's part of what needs to happen in order for everything to stay in balance. It's not like a thing that happens if shit goes bad. No, it's just part of the process. It's like seasons. It's going to happen eventually, right? But the longer you wait for that correction, if it doesn't happen now, my belief is that it's going to be that much worse later. I'll use myself as an example so nobody feels like they're being attacked. My life has been a very, very lucky and fortunate set of growth and opportunities that came at the right time at the right place and i haven't had a significant enough failure to impact me financially in a big way yet but it's not always gumdrops and lollipops it's not always rainbows and sunshine and uh, i think that i am due i've i've been incredibly lucky and incredibly fortunate and even my failures have impacted me financially dramatically I've failed a fucking ton. <laughs> so don't argue with this podcast of failure. Stop. <laughs> Not yet. But, uh, but in reality, I know that I'm due. I know that I'm due for some darker times. And maybe I'm going through a little bit of that right now. I mean, I've taken a huge seven-figure financial hit this year. But um, I, I don't know. I, I just know that your life can't always be easy. And adversity builds character, and I look forward to what that ultimately means for me personally. So I don't fear a recession. I'm going to do the best that I can to persevere and push through it, and I'm, I'm a worker. I'm going to work my ass through it. That's what I'm going to do. But that also means that opportunity is ahead too. Yeah. Right? I think if you can get through bad times, you can grow. Right. Um, also from C. West, uh, dropped a name that he wants us to look into, at Beardy Brandon. Beardy Brandon, he is the former founder and CEO of the Bigger Pockets kind of franchise and podcast. Uh -oh. He wrote a number of books. Um, believe it or not, despite popular belief, I've got a tremendous amount of respect for him and some other people. He has now become a syndicator, uh, and he puts together deals uh, where he brings in other investor money and puts it together. Unlike a lot of people who went from, I don't know, being a fucking car salesman or a motivational speaker, or a guru, this is a man who lived, breathed, and shit real estate and finance for fucking years. He wrote books on the topic, he hosted a podcast, and he went deep into really trying to figure out this space. And then ultimately, at what was seemingly the, the height of his fame, he starts his syndication group called Open Door Capital and starts syndicating deals. Mm. I think this is a guy who I've got respect for, and I think he's doing it the right way, and I have no problem with how he's doing things. I think we yes. recommend his, one of their books on the yeah, podcast. Yeah, I recommend before. his books all the time, The Bigger Pockets. He, he's actually the author of some of those books that I've ever recommended before. So straight cash on me. Yeah, straight cash. All right. Uh, this from Mr. James J. Cho. What's the goal for this podcast for each of you? Quitting your current jobs, extra income, etc. cetera. Hmm. Good question. Arun, I'd love to hear your answer. <laughs> yeah, he's been awfully quiet. Um, honestly, just growing the podcast, learning more about the industry. Obviously, um, as the audience can tell, I do not know as much as you guys. So a lot of this is learning for me as well. Mm. Mm. Well, I would start by suggesting being here more often. 
<laughs> well, I just gained six and a half hours today. So. <laughs> just, just, you have to take that jab while he's at it. For me, for me personally, um, it would be to grow this into something to where we can really make uh, some notable changes. I feel like, yes, we are providing a good service right now, but I feel like there's a lot of untapped potential in here, and I know that um, what we're capable of doing and uh, what can springboard off of this or from this on the side. And, you know, obviously we all want to make um, enough money to make it worth our time, but to also give back is something that you and I, I know, have especially like mm -hmm. spoken about. There's been companies or ideas that we've spitballed before that I would love to start exploring if we had some some capital from this thing to really start doing. So many of you may or may not know, I started the show originally with the ideology of a frustration behind me. There were so many people that I thought were just charlatans bullshitting their way to the space I didn't think had real credibility. But a cousin of mine was scammed and I'm, he was scammed by somebody that I thought was just really, really regurgitating information that didn't have any credibility. And when I tried to explain to him that he didn't, he called me jealous of the social media profile, which is kind of what precipitated me getting on social media, which ultimately precipitated the podcast. The podcast also started with the thought that, you know, God forbid something happens to me, Saeed, to ruin our kids, have hours, in this case, well over 200 hours, hearing our voices. Mm -hmm. This will, frankly, transcend our existence on this planet if we continue to keep it going until... You know, we die ultimately, there, there'll be enough here. And maybe maybe someone will turn that into AI at one point that can speak and sound like us. Yeah, and hopefully it transcend, transcends over to transcendcompany.com slash THSP. I stuttered when I said it. God damn it. You did. It's, it, you're so happy to get a <laughs> plug so in. He was like, <laughs> fuck yes. Which, by the way, I got my uh, Motsi, my Testafin, or Testamorlin, whatever the fuck it is, uh, a couple days ago. I, I just figured out the dosing protocol for Motsi, which is actually a little bit different than I thought it was going to be. Uh, take it three times a week for four weeks and then down to once a week. But uh, I'm super excited uh, to get that started. So my mom leaves on Friday from her visit. She's mm -hmm. been in town for the last couple of weeks. And then uh, I'm uh, I'm going full force. Balls to the wall. All the walls. All the walls. Touch all the walls. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see uh, how all that works out. I'm really excited for Motsi. I've heard good things from Sal. Yeah. Um Long story short, I would love to gain even more fulfillment from this than we're already getting. I will say, I don't think any of us went into this with the idea of replacing our primary income until we talked to Adam, Sal, Doug, and Justin. <laughs> and we're like, hey, how much fucking money y'all making? Yeah. Oh, okay. God damn. I mean, I'll take like one twelfth of that shit. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. They do all right. They do okay. They do okay. Rightfully so. Yeah. Rightfully so. They were uh, pioneers, trailblazers. If you will. Oh, dude. So ahead of the curve. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jay Track put out there. Chris Nahibi. We already covered that trash. Uh, Vic Ramirez. What major shocks to the economy should people be prepared for? Volatility. I expect there to be volatility. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of manipulation in the, in the traditional media as it comes closer to the election. I think you're going to see a lot of people struggling to keep the happy, happy, joy, joy bullshit on um, CNBC. As the market rises. And I think you're going to see some volatility. Don't expect to see all this optimism from the rate cuts equate to really good things happen in the, the economy. I think you're going to start to see people go, oh, my God, they're going to cut rates. It's amazing. The market's going to pop a little bit. And certain segments, certainly like the banking sector, are going to do great. And the mm -hmm. other sectors aren't going to do great. And then the market's going to like not react like people think. And it's right. going to be really, really weird. So volatility. Expect so, volatility. Yeah, and don't be surprised if you start to see some negative Fed speak come out because the Fed is upset that people have completely misinterpreted everything that they've said so far. They've already started. Yeah. They've already started, like, kind of walking it back. Like, we said higher for longer. Don't forget. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. I'm not sure I've seen the data that makes me feel like we should have a rate cut yet. Right. Exactly. They've all started to come out. So because they're fully aware if, if everyone is priced in or is expecting a rate cut by that March meeting, and if they don't get one— there might be some problems. Yeah, there might be a... Um, uh, this from Isabel. Keaton Harris, a.k.a. The Muscle. That name sounded super familiar to me. I think... It, oh, yeah, this guy. Okay. Um, Who's this? Oh, this guy. Yeah. What a, You're going to say what a piece of shit. Aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, he is part of a group called Limitless Society. Let me just be clear. That's a bad start to a conversation. Holy shit, bro. Payment options. $297 monthly. A Limitless Society lifetime membership of $5,800. Or get some special one-on-one -on -one treatment for $9,500. Trash. Absolute god-awful trash. Um, I've seen him respond to some comments, which I thought were uh, tactless, frankly. Uh, and I also look at stuff like this and say to myself, okay, great. So you put on some giant, yeah, he does a, a, bro, he looks like Ronnie from Jersey shore. What are yeah. we, what are we doing? And he, uh, he puts on some big, big, um, oh God damn it. Andy's there. And I like Andy a lot. I like Andy a lot. Yeah. Too. Um, he puts on this big, uh, speaker conference thing, I think in Utah. Okay. Bradley's there is to look and Bradley was one of the first, when we started the podcast, Bradley was one of the first guys to, to, to repost us and put us out there for no other reason than, than he was like, I like what you guys are doing. Oh, dope. So, I mean, that doesn't mean just because if we, we call them, you know, or what they're selling trash, that doesn't mean they can't also recognize, they can't recognize good. I, I don't know. I, I've seen this guy respond in ways that I felt were hyper aggressive and wildly defensive in, in a way that I didn't really feel like was appropriate. Mm. That being said, I don't know enough about him to know why he thinks he can charge that for a society, a group that you join. All I'll say is this. It's going to be really, really difficult for you to prove to me that that's a value. Really, really, really difficult. Yeah. There are plenty of hyper successful people who sell courses for a whole hell of a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And, okay, the Limitless Society. Yeah. That just sounds sensational and sexy. But I was, it doesn't really say what it does or what it means other than the fact that it sounds like you've got unlimited potential. I'll never forget. I was I Recently, I was scrolling through the YouTube shorts, right? Because I'm constantly observing, trying to see, like, all right, what are, what are people, like, putting out there content-wise, style, formats, whatever, right? And I'm scrolling. I do that, too. Right? Because I'm too. curious, right? I want to know, like, what, what's working. Uh, how much the editor in you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? And I came across one of uh, Graham's, I don't even know, is it Stefan, Stephen? What Stephen. is it? Graham Stefan. Yeah. And he was interviewing Trash Cardone, okay? Yeah. And he brought up that Layla Harmozy, I think her name is, mm -hmm. bought Alex Harmozy one-on-one -on -one time with Grant Cardone. That's a true story, yeah. And it was something like $120,000 for like 20 to 30 minutes. Ugh. Okay, and I'm like, dude. And and Grant says, he says, oh, he, he just wanted to know. He wanted to find out like, what it is that I'm doing. Okay, first of all, if someone like Hormozzi is doing that, it's not because he's trying to learn how to syndicate deals from Grant Cardone. He's trying to figure out what is he doing as far as the algorithm goes and how he's picking up on clientels and how he's able to tap into these lower income households, right? And that's what really, really, really irks me. All right. And the this... fact and the fact and this is and and this is the part that should get scrutinized the most, okay? Graham Stefan is promoting this shit, okay, and giving that guy a platform to speak on. I've lost a lot of respect for Graham over the last couple of years, not because I think he's a bad person or malicious person. He seems like a fucking sweetheart of a human being, but because he's given everybody a platform on his podcast. And what bothers me is that this type of behavior is encouraged because the fastest way to grow on social media is, is to collaborate with other creators. And what bothers me immensely. And the reason why I stopped talking to Jamil Damji, for example, was because he went to a huge event that Grant Cardone put on and invited all these creators 10x his ass all the way to Florida. Exactly what happened. And to me, it's like, okay, you guys are all so desperate to grow your brands that you will collaborate with somebody who says some pretty unsavory and does some pretty unacceptable things. And then, okay, fine. Whether you think Grant Cardone's a good person or a bad person, whatever, I don't care. But at some point in time, you've got to say, okay, what do I stand for? What what is what is too far? What do I not want to be associated with? I I can't be everyone's friend. I've got to take a moral stand. I have this argument all the time with friends and family, and I say, look, if you if you don't stand up for something, when there's something to stand up for, 
then effectively you're saying you stand for nothing, right? And it sounds really simple and trivial when you say it like that, but look, you can't be fucking Switzerland, right? You got, you got to take a stand in life. A guy like Andy Frazella, I like him a lot because he will tell you straight up, like, fuck you, this is how I feel. I don't give a shit about your feelings. This is what I think we need to do. Love or hate him for who he is as a person, like, you know, like that he takes a stance, mm -hmm. right? You can't be everyone's friend. You got to have some type of enemies. And if you don't have any enemies, then you're probably not an authentic person. Not telling people how you really feel, right? It's just that simple. All facts. When I see someone like Hermosi, I judged Hermosi for a long period of time as being in that circle. And I was like, fuck that guy. But I will say, I've looked at his content and I think him and his wife, Meh, I think they have pretty good content. I think some a lot of it is entrepreneur bro stuff. It bothers me like that because I don't like the bro, do this, bro, <laughs> bro. Like, I don't like that stuff. I but, like it when it's parody. But I will say Hermosi's exhibited some ethics and some transparency. His wife seems to have some ethics and some transparency, and they seem to be people that are trying to monetize the algorithm. And my fucking opinion doesn't mean anything here, I'm sure, to them. They've clearly got a way bigger following than, than, than we do for all sorts of reasons. But I don't understand the intrinsic value in someone like Grant Cardone for social media. I don't understand the intrinsic value in a lot of people. I get someone like Hermosi. Like, he's positive. He's motivational. He's written two great books. Mm. I get that. I don't understand the draw to people like Cardone. And I don't understand people like Hermosi wanting to get, like, why do you need Grant Cardone's insight? I, don't, I think I think it's more than it's it's not that I think what it is is just you know validation and being seen with him gives you more of a status symbol. He wasn't seen with him, not that I'm aware of. Like so, for example, you know Pineda, Pineda came out of the 10x group. He, he there's young videos of him online where you can see him as a young like former baseball player who went to a 10x conference and totally bought in. Mm -hmm. And all those guys are put on by a guy named Ryan Magan. Ryan Magan owns a company in Las Vegas called Viral Edits, and he's the one who films and edits all the content for Grant Cardone, for Pineda. Uh, I think he did Hermosi for a while. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about Hermosi. I think he did him at one point in time. Uh, and he certainly did. He does Chris Crone, that complete, total, colossal piece of shit. So it, it, it's a circle of people. And I, I'm, I'm fully aware and cognitive of the fact that we've alienated ourselves from a lot of these groups by taking a stance, but I'd rather fucking have morals and not worry about it, then then I would uh, be questionable and and be in the spectrum there. Breach. All right, let's rapid fire through some of these. Um, this again from Isabel. If all three of you were to walk into a Mexican restaurant, what are y'all ordering? This is easy. Yeah, carne asada burrito. Carne asada burrito. And the guy with gout gets mm, tacos. No, he gets chicken burrito. Chicken burrito. And a taco. And Maybe so, a California burrito. With eh. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, we do routinely get, as yeah. you can tell. Um, if you three could be any celebrity for a day, who would you choose to be? Jeff Goldblum. Stud that. Celeste. Jeff Goldblum? Yeah. Okay. Stud. Really? I'll sit you on the back of my plane and be Jeff Bezos. <laughs> He's not a celebrity, dude. He's a celebrity, bro. You can't be a fucking celebrity for being rich. Yes, you can be. No, that's not a real celebrity. <laughs> that's a real celebrity. That's not a celebrity. Is okay, Elon so Musk you're, a celebrity? No, he's rich. We're talking, uh, come on, bro. Uh, we're talking about, okay, we're talking about then actors, actors and actresses. That's what we're talking about. Okay, I'm sorry. You want to be one of the wealthiest humans in the world for a day. Yeah. Yeah, and blow it all. <laughs> You know it's a financial literacy podcast, right? Yeah, by the way, it's blown up. Yeah. Yeah, buy a yeah, bunch yeah. of Tesla. Yeah, no, but buy a bunch of Tesla stock, though. <laughs> you guys, it's, stop coughing. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Indonesia, I just bought you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, by the Philippines. Well, I'll be Drake for Change a Change it for PH to an F. Yeah. <laughs> That's what y'all get. Confusing people. <laughs> I'd be Drake for a day. No, you <laughs> just change his whole image. <laughs> exactly. Say so he's Drake for every day. Yeah, exactly. You know what it is. Uh, this is from Misa. Me, Kevin, covered him. Complete trash. Um, why do you think Chris talks about the black card and balling so hard? I wasn't aware that I did. You, you, damn. You don't. You don't even realize you talk about balling so hard. First of all, I don't talk about balling so hard. But here's here's the truth of the matter. Oh, here we go. Fuck you. <laughs> Here we go. Rolling. Final answer. His eyes are rolling behind the wall. The fact of the matter is, is the, ball, the black card, which we've glorified in society and made to sound like us to fucking... You can't even do it. Fuck out of here. 
I'm hey. going to get this one. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what it is. It's little man syndrome. That's what it is. And by little trying man- to make this sound like a status symbol, like it means something, like getting it, it gets you into a club. I just try to make it sound as clear as possible that it's not a club. It just doesn't mean that you, you're worth a lot. It doesn't mean that you make a lot. It just means that you spend a lot, and that is not an admirable thing. Yeah, I agree. Fuck you're, you. And you're showing people that it's not all it's hyped up to be, and no. you're really pissed at the Platinum members for getting into your lounges. <laughs> You don't like it. It bothers you. Admit that it bothers you. I'm not going to admit that it bothers me. Come on, man. You're, here's what I... Okay, you want me to admit some I want you to admit some shit. shit. Yeah, all right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I'll admit some fucked up shit. What bothers me... So when you go into some lounges, okay, they have a separate Centurion play, like space. Inside the lounge, there's a there's a red rope for, for y'all. Yeah. Okay. And then it's, you know, whatever. What bothers me about the platinum versus the black car thing is I still got to wait in the same fucking line to you to, as you to get in the lounge. Oh, you should get some like TSA pre-check. That's what I'm saying. Right. Like, I should be like, hey, y'all peasants, right? Move over. <laughs> hey, amateur hour to the left. Let me see your card. Oh, it's, ooh, it's silver. Go that way. Yeah. Let me see. Oh, silver that way. Yeah. Yeah, none of that. Uh, the best you get is you get like a laminated like card when you check in in the same line as everybody else. Right. And then you, when you walk upstairs, they go, oh, right this way to your special you know, cocksucker section right here. And that's where that's, that's where I go when I go inside. Damn. But um, yeah, it's not, uh, it's the same concierge number, frankly. I mean, it's not that different. But the benefits, if you have like an Equinox membership and you go, it's worth it. Other, right. other than that, I don't know that it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see here. And last but not least, from Mr. James Cho. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I can't even read it. What does it say? <laughs> what does Odun want to say about the war in the Middle East? Oh, Popcorn God emoji. Damn it. That's a good way to wrap up the show. No. Go ahead, Odin. You should mm. you should honestly You know what? Fuck it. Yeah. We're at the hour 30 mark. There's probably two people listening. Go ahead. Give no, me a fucking No, you deserve it. it. You deserve it. Yeah, knock yourself out. Deserve what? Out. Nothing, man. Just uh be a better person. Be better humans. Everyone be better. That's what you want to say about Kaza? Do better. It just says my least. Kaza? Doesn't <laughs> Christopher, I try to do it. Like, no, you can't. This is not. A, this not you can't, we can't laugh about this. I can't say G- Gaza. Gaza. They don't say Gaza. Gaza. Huh? <laughs> what? Gaza. That's how you say it. No, that's, how, that's how I say it. Yeah. That's how you say it. But uh, anyway, that's not <laughs> what you want to say about Palestine. Yes, it is. Come on, man. I've seen your feed, bro. You got uh, opinions. Come on. My opinion is everyone should be a better human. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah. Nothing more than that. Oh, strive, wow. He's taking strive, that. strive to be better. No, he's, he's, he's strive, no, I, I strive completely, to be better. No, I completely because he's also that. not unreasonable in thinking that there aren't innocent civilians over on the other side, too. Oh, both sides got hurt. Yeah, both sides got hurt. And it's really, really sad what's going on to the people over in Palestine because a majority of, of what's happening to them is to, to their children. And it's sad when children don't stand a chance. That's and as a new parent. It's hard to watch. Can I ask? Can I ask a question? And I, I mean this objectively, without completely understanding myself. I think it's safe to say that the media has been weaponized in a lot of ways. We've seen a lot of images from inside Palestine of some really, really horrendous things happening to children. Mm-hmm. Undeniable. Both sides. I have not seen the same footage for Israel. Well, because it's not happening at. The, I mean, that's the whole debate, right? It's not happening like, at the same the same amount, right? The, look at body counts; it's not even remotely close. Well, it's not even the body counts. I think like the biggest argument that has not been answered yet is where's the proof of what happened on October seventh? That's I think what the biggest question is. Okay. Oh, that's that's a that's a stretch. Uh, so let, let let's let's just. Let's just say that why do they need to, if you're, if really what October 7th happened, Mm -hmm. does Israel focus on getting that media out to the world to justify what they need to do? Or do they just do what they feel like they need to do? Not saying that this is what was needed, but I mean, shouldn't the right thing be like, fuck the media, we're going to war. Like, Mm -hmm. shouldn't that be, shouldn't there be less images out there? Looking and shouldn't in. there be more images of Palestine just just from a functional perspective? Because what's happening in Palestine is happening consistently versus a singular one-time attack on Israel, at least. It sounds that way. Yeah, well, the thing that bothers me the most personally about this is what we are now seeing now in this 24-hour media cycle has been going on for tens of hundreds of years. Except now we're seeing it. 
Oh, okay? and the U.S. has done this in many fucking countries. And let's not let's not fool ourselves in thinking that this is all done based on a numbers game. Okay, the U.S. is always going to do whatever favors the U.S. more. It benefits them more. Their allies to provide aid to their allies, and this isn't the first time that they've provided aid to their allies, where they're attacking people and innocent civilians are being hurt. Right. So this isn't the first time. This is this this is what we're being privy to. This is something that Jocko said, Jocko Willick, mm-hmm. right? And it's like everybody wants freedom, but nobody wants to know the cost of that freedom. Dude, go to the Vietnam War Museum. I've been there. Let me tell right? you. It's a fucking twisted version of the story you heard, you heard growing up. Right? And I've said this because this thing has been going on for so long, man. When I was in college in, uh, in 2009, I'll never forget, like, mm-hmm. this thing was going on at UCI, and people were driving their cars on campus, on campus and hitting people. Yeah, yeah. It's been crazy, right? One and, of the original pieces of art that I have in my house is a uh, uh, Shepard Fairley uh, original. That's uh, the, the name of it is titled Israel Palestine. Mm-hmm. And it's of a woman that you can't tell whether she's Israeli or Palestinian because, objectively speaking, they look aesthetically very similar, yes. culturally. And it's two different colored sides of the same kind of curtains, if you will. It's a very interesting piece when you think about it in the context of of what that really is supposed to symbolize. And she's afraid to come outside. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I've seen it. Um, and, yeah, man, it's just, if if this situation had been going on in any other point in history, let's just say it would have already been over. But because of the media coverage that it gets and the 24-hour news cycle that we're in, it's being dragged out, mm. right? And that's that's the harsh reality at the end of the day. And I think that's what hurts, like, Odun, it hurts me, and it hurts people that, like, we're close to. I'm, I know it hurts you, too. It's just seeing this play out in front of all of our eyes is, like, look, as humans, we were not, I don't think anyone is is built to be able to deal with this shit. No, I don't think they are either. But what I will say is, is um, I I do question how this is being weaponized from a media perspective against younger generations who are quick to choose a side and divide themselves in the United States. Woke culture playing into things like this because they've taken a stance on a war they don't fully understand in some ways. I think is is kind of crazy and dangerous. Well, the sad part is, well, we live and operate in a country that separates church and state, and we're analyzing a part of the world that doesn't. Yeah. So. All right. Well, um, I'm gonna need a dick. Did, joke can we get? A, can I get a, a dick joke? Somebody, <laughs> yeah. please. Arun. Um, winner for best question. Is, oh, uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Christian Garcia, Mister Thankful. Chris came in with uh, with the proof. Oh, that was good. That's right. I hadn't even heard of that. He wrote before. Mr. Thankful, but it's actually Mr. Thank You. Well, you want to correct Christian Garcia while you award him 100 bucks? Yeah. <laughs> That's why. He felt bad because yeah, right. he, tra- he trashed him at first. Oh, I searched for him, and Chris was like, you don't even know how to do your job, bro. I did not say that. I was thinking it, but I didn't yeah. say it. Rewind. All right. All right. Well, I will uh, I'll send uh, Mr. Garcia a DM here saying you just got 100 bucks, bro. Oh, that's hey, really Christian. That's really bad on Mister Thank You's part, though. That's so lazy. It's uh, it's just right there. I mean, it's like I look at that. and I'm like, okay, well, maybe he didn't. Maybe it's supposed to be a joke. Yeah. Um. All right, Odin. You got anything else? Uh, no. For our podcast and Spotify listeners, if you haven't done so yet and you've stuck around to the hour and thirty seven, hour and thirty eight mark, we would really appreciate if you go over and leave us an honest five star review. Helps out the show a lot. For our YouTube listeners, please make sure you subscribe, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and please do all the moist, goody, good stuff. Well, you know what I'm saying? You got anything? No, I'm useless tonight. You're useless you tonight? You ran the show, bro. I'm just bro, that, What are you talking about? You nailed it. What are you talking about, nailed it? Honestly, though, do yourself a favor and go and review that uh, Black Rock document that I was talking about earlier. It was a really good read. Just pat yourself in the back. Yeah. I gave you some good shit. Go read it. Yeah, and I'll plug a dad channel on Instagram. (laughs) Good night, everybody. Fuck. (laughs) Bye.